Okay, here, here comes to our last speaker today, Mr. Sean Gibbs. Mr. Sean Gibbs is the CEO of Hanscom Inter Intercontinental Limited. He has held directorships and senior commercial positions with contracting and consultancy firms in the United Kingdom in, and internationally. With over 30 years experience in the onshore and offshore construction and engineering industries across the globe, Sean has worked across the continents of Europe, Asia, Middle East, Africa, and the Americas. He has acted as quantum expert before various dispute resolution tribunals, including adjudication, dispute board, expert determination, and arbitration. The topic that Sean will share to us, with us today is, this, is dispute, av, dispute avoidance and dispute resolution. Mr. Gibbs, please. Great, okay. You're right, so have my name's Sean Gibbs, and I'm going to be talking about dispute avoidance and dispute resolution. Um, as was mentioned, I work for the uh, com company Hanscom Intercontinental, and we provide expert witness and expert advisory services. Uh, and we cover construction engineering and shipbuilding. Um, I myself have been called to the bar by the Middle Temple. I'm also a fellow of the RICS. I'm not going to talk too much about that. Um, the company itself has got multidisciplinary experts, um, and we work in a wide range of ADR forums. Um, in terms of dispute resolutions, it's recognised as a problem globally. So if you look at the uh, crux report done by HKA, there's disputes and, and, and issues arising from disputes across the globe. Uh, in particular, in the recent crux report in 2022, they looked at 104 projects in Asia across 22 countries, uh, and their uh, average uh, values claimed on those projects was $90.4 million. That's US dollars uh, per project. Uh, and 65% average EOTs were claimed on each of those projects. So disputes are a problem, uh, and they're a particular problem uh, in the construction industry. In the United Kingdom, uh, despite having many standard forms with dispute resolution and tiered uh, dispute resolution, in the last couple of years, we've actually had a cross-border uh, uh, agreement to uh, try to implement a conflict avoidance pledge. This recognises that um, before it, a, a matter becomes a dispute, it can be avoided by taking robust action. Uh, some of the people that have signed up will be obviously known to uh, people in Hong Kong, such as the Institute of Civil Engineers, the ICC, that's the International Chamber of Commerce, Dispute Resolution Board Foundation, uh, as well as the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators. Uh, and it's quite, uh, it, it's quite unusual in terms of the conflict avoidance process that not only did large professional uh, institutes uh, want to sign up to this, but also um, some of the companies doing some of the largest uh, projects in, in the UK. So Transport for London and Network Rail, uh, probably two of the largest employers uh, of, of, of construction clients. Now, the conflict avoidance pledge itself um, is, um, is supported by other um, tools and information. So what they've done is they've published a 16-page guide, and in this guide it gives you justification for early conflict avoidance and early intervention techniques. Um, conflict avoidance and dispute resolution processes are uh, outlined in, in the guide, and they believe that it can be dealt with by dealing with contract provisions. Um, they recommend conflict avoidance panels uh, and these conflict avoidance panels uh, operate in a number of ways, including early neutral evaluation and project-based dispute boards, as well as evaluative mediation. Um, what they've also done as well is create a toolkit, a conflict avoidance toolkit, um, which helps people try to avoid conflicts by pre-contract preparation, uh, the utilisation of dispute avoidance, uh, recognising early, early intervention is key, uh, recognising that amicable resolution is more preferable than having to go on to dispute resolution. Um, now, you probably wondered why I outlined that. Um, obviously, in the United Kingdom, for many years, we've had both the NEC3 and NEC4 contracts, as well as FIDIC contracts. And that's what I'm going to be talking about today uh, for the majority of the time, the dispute resolution and dispute avoidance processes in those two contracts. Um, even though we've had these contracts, the conflict avoidance pledge was deemed necessary by people in industry. 
So it just goes to show that some of the standard forms aren't necessarily keeping up with best, with best practice in terms of dispute avoidance and how to resolve the disputes once they arise. Um, in terms of the NEC contract itself, the latest version of NEC is the NEC4, um, and they have um, various dispute resolution processes in there. Uh, they're called W1, W2, and W3. W1 and W3 uh, deal with a situation where the United Kingdom uh, Housing and Generation Act doesn't apply. Uh, and so for the purposes of today, I'm going to be looking at just the uh, options W1 and W3. Uh, these are actually applicable and could be utilised either in Hong Kong or in the Greater Bay region uh, in, terms, in terms of dealing with disputes. Um, so the NEC4 contract also has a, 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 a subcontract uh, and it's the Dispute Resolution Services contract. And it doesn't matter if a person's acting as an adjudicator or a dispute board member, uh, they'll enter into this Dispute Resolution Services contract uh, in conjunction with the parties. Uh, option W1 um, is essentially a multi-tiered dispute resolution option. Um, what it requires is that the um, uh, parties refer all of their disputes to the party senior representatives and these will be specified in the uh, contract data. Uh, and this is a mandatory step before you can escalate it further, i.e. you can't go on to arbitrate or litigate unless you've followed this uh, process of going first to the senior representatives that are specified in the contract data. Um, it's been said that it's become long-winded and open to abuse, but having to follow the uh, senior representative process um, but it has had some success. Um, essentially, there's a process which is dictated, and that is that each party must submit a statement of case within a week of notification. Uh, this, the, the submissions are limited to 10 sides of A4 uh, paper uh, and also supporting evidence. Um, senior representatives, though, can attend as many meetings and use any procedure necessary to resolve the dispute over a period of no more than three weeks. So the early intervention by senior representatives from both sides um, is viewed as uh, working successfully or could lead to, to working successfully in terms of avoidance of disputes uh, and also maintaining the parties' relationships. So, for example, where you've got a large client who does a lot of repeat work, they're probably not going to want to fall out with their contractors and certainly the contractors aren't going to fall out with a good employer. Um, at the end of the dispute resolution process, a list of issues is produced and the project manager and contractor uh, must put any agreed issues into action. Um, so the process itself, though, is to be without prejudice and no evidence of either statement of case or the discussions can be disclosed in subsequent proceedings. So some of the rationale for this is that it's going to allow the people to be more open and transparent on what they're doing and saying. Um, uh, adjudication. Uh, is also a secondary process under W1 and arbitration and litigation are the final uh, resolution processes under that uh, particular um, form. Um, if you do go to adjudication um, and you're not happy with a decision, um, th then there's the option then to proceed further on to refer the dispute to a tribunal for final determination. Under the NEC uh, form of contract, um, essentially, the parties either choose litigation or arbitration uh, as the tribunal, and it gives some flexibility in that. Um, the option W3 is quite different to W1, and it's used uh, outside of the United Kingdom where the Construction Act doesn't apply in the United Kingdom, uh, and it uses a DAB, a Dispute Avoidance Board, rather than adjudication. The Dispute Avoidance Board uh, in the NEC is very different from the Dispute uh, Adjudication Board in FIDIC, and I'm going to touch upon that later on when I talk about the FIDIC forms of contract and how they can be used to avoid or resolve disputes. Um, and what is important is that the DEAB procedure must be followed before either party could refer uh, the dispute to court or arbitration. The way that the DAB uh, has been designed in this um, suite of contracts is that it consists of one or three members. Uh, the number of members is stated quite clearly in the contract data in part one. Uh, if there were to be three members, both the client and the contractor nominate an individual 
and they're named in the contract data and the parties jointly choose the third member, uh, there is also provisions for dealing with a member not being able to act. So that means that the uh, board won't fail because they not properly constituted or someone leaves. Um, as I touched upon before, um, the, um, the dispute board members will be appointed under the NEC uh, DRSC form of contract. That's the green contract that you saw on my earlier slides. Uh, and, and that applies to all of the W option clauses that I've touched upon. Um, the DABs are supposed to visit the site of intervals. Um, this frequency is specified in the contract data. And the aim is that the DAB uh, will inspect the progress of the works and become aware of potential issues uh, thereby resolving disputes before they become disputes. Um, a potential dispute is notified to the DAB between two to four weeks after notification to the other party and the project manager. Uh, the dispute board itself only makes recommendations. It doesn't issue a binding decision. Um, if you're in America, they may term this a dispute review board and it's akin to a dispute review board. Um, Unless the parties have resolved uh, the issue by the end of the visit, the DABs will provide a recommendation for resolving issues. Uh, only if a party is dissatisfied with the recommendation is a dispute referred to either court or arbitration as appropriate. The dissatisfied party must notify the other party the matter which it disputes and state that it intends to refer to court or arbitration as appropriate within four weeks of notification of the DAB recommendation. Uh, I'm now going to look at the FIDIC forms of contract. Now, the FIDIC forms of contract uh, have been around since 1957, uh, and it's only in the sort of l latter years of their um, publication where you've started seeing the active use of dispute boards uh, and dispute boards uh, with a remit to help avoid disputes. Um, the um, FIDIC forms of contract are now published in Mandarin. I'm not sure exactly which versions are currently available in Mandarin, but there are official uh, uh, form, forms of the contract. Um, the 99 forms uh, have a creature known as a dispute adjudication board. Uh, the dispute adjudication board is very similar uh, to a dispute avoidance and adjudication board, which was created by the 2017 forms. And the reason I say that is um, under both contracts, the dispute board uh, visits site regularly, has input, it can help resolve uh, disputes before they arise by informal negotiation. They can also provide opinion um, to the parties. Uh, they can provide uh, non-binding um, recommendations. Uh, and they can also, unlike the um, NEC form, they can provide a binding uh, decision. Now, the 2017 forms of uh, contracts issued by FIDIC um, were slightly improve and, and, and the emphasis was more on being able to avoid disputes and that's why the, 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 the particular form of dispute there is, is entitled the Dispute Avoidance and Adjudication Board. Um, in terms of um, comparing and contrasting NEC and FIDIC, um, the NEC4 W3 uh, process has a dispute avoidance board. They provide a recommendation. If the parties don't accept the recommendation, then it can be resolved by the tribunal. The FIDIC forms of contract, uh, the dispute adjudication and avoidance board, uh, can firstly offer informal discussions. They can also provide opinions. Uh, then they, if there isn't any uh, uh, parties reach agreement, they're able to issue a binding decision on the matter. Uh, and then the final recourse there is to ICC arbitration. If you look at um, um, the FIDIC forms for many years, they've always chosen ICC arbitration. There's no litigation. One of the reasons specifically for this is that the contract is used in an international setting. It quite often involves parties uh, from different jurisdictions contracting. Uh, hence, uh, they've always chosen to include the ICC arbitration provisions there as it's deemed most su suitable for that cross-border type of work. This is in contrast to the NEC. The NEC uh, contract itself originally was created for the use in the United Kingdom. Uh, it's obviously been adopted and used around the world. 
uh, not to the extent that the uh, Philip forms of contract have. But if you look at the Hong Kong market, they've been regular users of the NEC uh, suites of contract now for many years. Uh, and then obviously their process uh, in the NEC uh, is to choose between a court or arbitral uh, ar ar arbitration. Um, probably one of the disadvantages of the NEC is it's not explicit in its ar arbitration processes. Uh, whereas the, uh, the 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 forms of contract uh, are very explicit in the way that the ICC uh, arbitration will be conducted, uh, and outline the processes and procedures to get the uh, the, the, the the arbitration underway, uh, and also and also to maintain it. Um, one thing that you may find, though, um, and it doesn't matter which uh, which, which uh, forms used, um, is that some courts may not recognize an interim and binding uh, decision when it comes to enforcement. And this is particularly uh, found in uh, civil code countries. In terms of um, other forms of contract, obviously there's EPC forms of contract which people use. Uh, and these are particularly for oil and gas, uh, petrochem, uh, chemical engineering. Um, they that they don't necessarily have uh, all of the um, necessary uh, tools or mechanisms to, help to, to, to enable them to operate. So, for example, the NEC4 itself has a very detailed dispute resolution services contract, uh, which supports the main contract provisions, uh, and it also allows for the parties to easily engage uh, those that would uh, act as adjudicator or dispute board member or even arbitral tribunal member. So that's a whistle stop tour of the two sort of main forms of contract that you might come across. Um, as I touched upon at the uh, uh, beginning, um, even though in the United Kingdom um, that we had standard forms and we had standard form provisions, um, professional bodies, clients, uh, as well as contractors felt necessary to uh, launch a conflict avoidance process and a conflict avoidance uh, pledge. Um, this is because they felt that the standard forms were lacking uh, in some ways. So in most of the standard forms disputes almost arise then are resolved. Uh, and under this uh, conflict avoidance process, um, the, the plan is that you don't allow the problems uh, to arise um, so you, you you try to head them off. Uh, it encourages uh, a lot more communication and dialogue uh, than may be emphasised in the uh, standard form contracts. That's not to say you can't amend the standard form contracts, um, but it's something to bear in mind. Um, early neutral evaluation uh, is akin to some of the processes that I've touched upon in the uh, in the NEC four. And the, and, and the fitted forms of contracts. Uh, Project-based dispute boards are obviously uh, available under both uh, the NEC and the fitted forms of contract. Um, what's not um, explicitly spelled out in either of those is the use of, of evaluative mediation. Uh, and that might be something that you may wish to um, uh, amend in those standard form contracts to include a sort of more formalized uh, mediation process. It's certainly something that's on, on an international basis is becoming more and more used in construction projects. Um, I've already touched upon the conflict avoidance toolkit. Um, if you go to the uh, website, which is uh, managed by the uh, RICS and you look for conflict avoidance pledge, you'll be able to find uh, the toolkit. Um, I certainly encourage you to look at it. Uh, it's some very useful things to think about in there particularly at pre-contract stages. Um, and, and probably the, the most important thing to um, to do when negotiating a contract is actually think about the ways that you're going to avoid disputes. If we go back to the uh, the first slide, um, I looked at where you had um, the spread of disputes around the globe. It's a global problem, disputes and dispute resolution. Um, it's tackled in th different ways in different countries. So if you look at the uh, uh, North America, uh, one of the tools that they've decided to use over there on their large infrastructure projects are dispute review boards. Um, 
probably the biggest drawback with a dis dispute review board is that you can go through the process and then you don't have a binding decision. Uh, so that's something that uh, uh, diminishes its importance. Uh, if we look at South America, South America as a whole, sorry about that, the slides just jumped. South America as a whole um, didn't use dispute boards for many years. In the sort of last five years, you're starting to see an uptake in dispute boards. Uh, and the forms of dispute boards there are dispute adjudication boards. Uh, that means that they can issue binding uh, decisions. Um, if we look at Africa as a whole, um, they have a lot of investment in the country. Quite a lot of it is from uh, multilateral bank funding. They tend to use uh, fitted forms of contract for a lot of the works. Uh, and they'll also include the dispute board provisions contained within the fitted forms of contract. Uh, if you look at Europe, which is obviously in green on the map, uh, the United Kingdom uh, and Ireland are probably the anomaly because we have a statutory uh, construction adjudication process. Uh, that meant that that's really meant that dispute boards haven't really been utilised in the United Kingdom to any great extent. Um, if we touch on then the mainland Europe, um, we were starting to see more and more use of dispute boards. Uh, in part of the provision. Some of this is because of the use of fiddic forms of contract, but it's also because the advisors and lawyers that are advising parties are aware of the benefits of dispute boards. Uh, one sort of region that doesn't, doesn't really use dispute boards or historically hasn't used dispute boards is the Middle East. They'll quite often um, have a tiered dispute resolution clause, uh, which will eventually um, lead to an arbitration of some, for, of dis some sort. Um, if we go down to Australia and Australasia, um, historically they didn't use dispute boards, uh, though they are now, so the dispute board mechanisms uh, seem quite popular. Uh, turning to Asia, Hong Kong for many years has had various standard form contracts in terms of public works. Now the NEC certainly seems in the predominance. Uh, China itself has its own standard forms of contract, uh, as well as starting to use FIDIC forms of contract. If we turn to uh, some of the other Asian countries, such as India, historically, um, they didn't use FIDIC forms of contract. They had various bespoke forms of contract that they were using and standard form contracts, which were unique to India. Uh, with a large investment in infrastructure, they're starting to use FIDIC forms of contract. Um, in terms of uh, the former CIS states, uh, so you have places like Azerbaijan, uh, Kazakhstan. Um, they you tend to use EPC, EPCM contracts, so they're all in gas projects. Uh, and then it, and some of the other sort of projects, some of their larger building or infrastructure projects, and they tend to use FIDIC forms of contract. Um, so I'm just going to jump back through the slides. Um, so in terms of what Hong Kong and the Greater Bay Area can do, um, is they can learn from what everyone else is doing around the world. Um, they've got a real choice at the moment where they can decide to adopt uh, fitted forms of contract uh, or, or based on the knowledge and expertise of those who work with uh, contract forms in Hong Kong, they can decide to choose to go with the NEC forms of contract. Uh, no matter which form of contract you choose, you do need to spend money training people and able to administer the contracts properly. One of the biggest sources of disputes, according to studies, is the failure for people to administer contracts. Uh, so it doesn't matter which form of contract you choose, but you must have people capable of administering it correctly if you do wish to avoid disputes. Okay, so that's the end of the formal part of my presentation. Yeah, I can see the question. So the question is, in terms of dispute avoidance, which contract form is more effective from your personal experience, NEC or FIDIC? I've got to be honest, both of them are just as effective as the other. And it really depends on the parties and, 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 and the players that are involved in administering the contracts. So for example, I've used FIDIC uh, in Africa, uh, and it didn't um, help avoid disputes on a particular project but that was more to do with the people that were involved in that particular project. Similarly, I've used NEC in uh, Africa, in South Africa. Uh, it didn't help avoid disputes, but that was 
primarily because of the parties and, and, and the way that they were staffing the contract and they, they didn't comply with the contract provisions. Their, their, their behaviour and, and conduct um, led to a lot of the disputes and, and quite often the disputes were unnecessary. Um, equally, I've used um, the NEC forms of contract in the United Kingdom and they've worked extremely effectively in avoiding disputes. Um, what I do see though, and, and this must be borne in mind, is that parties who believe they're going to have a long-term working relationship after that particular project um, will make more effort to avoid disputes and they'll be more willing, um, one, to um, spend the time properly administering the contract and two, being reasonable in how they conduct themselves. Um, and I think that's a, a, an important key. It's not just the forms of contract. Uh, it's also um, the party's desire for a relationship afterwards. Um, the, the NEC form of contract has been criticised by many because it is quite um, onerous in terms of um, administration staff, uh, which you, you need to do to comply because it's got quite strict time bar and provisions and also the way that you no, no, notify time and cost via the compensation event. Um, but I think both, both forms can work very well. What I would say is the NEC forms of contract um, have quite a bit of literature about them, but not to the extent that the FIDIC forms of contract have. So if you do have inexperienced staff and they need access to resources, I'd say that the FIDIC forms have a much more greater uh, wealth of resources available to them to help parties uh, understand uh, various issues that arise in each clause and also how to resolve them or how they can interpret them. Sean, question two. FIDIC is not very common in Hong Kong. Would you suggest to introduce FIDIC for those mega scale infrastructure projects here? I'd, I'd certainly encourage people in Hong Kong to look at the FIDIC forms of contract. Um, over the years, they've grown. So you've got everything from uh, uh, the FIDIC Red Book, which can be used for works which are designed by the employer, um, through now to the Emerald Book. The Emerald Book's designed for underground works. So, for example, MTR. Uh, tunneling works. I know there's a lot of um, large complex tunneling done for drainage in Hong Kong um, and the, and the FIDIC Emerald book would probably lend itself well for that. Uh, just as with any sort of new form of contract introduced into a market, there'll be a learning curve for people. Um, I'd suggest that the FIDIC uh, form uh, it's probably got one of the lower um, learning curves. I, I believe it's quite intuitive. And anyone who can read a contract will be able to read the FIDIC form and, and, and apply it easily. Um, also, what's, um, what, what you've seen in the, in, in, in the years is you're getting more people working on a cross-border basis. And when I say that, um, for years, there were only a few limited number of large contractors in Hong Kong, uh, and they were doing work for Hong Kong um, clients. What you're seeing is now that you've got, say, Chinese developers, and you may have Korean contractors uh, coming into the marketplace. Um, a lot of these companies that work on an international basis do like the FIDIC forms, they understand them, they're, 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 they're happy with them. Uh, that's not to say that you should throw out the NEC, I think this NEC still has its place in Hong Kong and, and obviously it's, it's quite well established now and there's a lot of people uh, experienced in utilising it. So I've got a question three, uh, and the question three is, how do you comment on the effectiveness of the various adjudication laws in different jurisdictions? for the promotion of speedy resolution of payment disputes, often between subcontractor and main contractor. E.g. Singapore makes it very speedy to decide within three to four weeks. Hong Kong is going to legislate a similar one in the next year, question mark. Okay, um, in terms of adjudication, um, they, it, it differs around the world. So if you look at the statutory schemes, so for example, if you take the United Kingdom, I think the United Kingdom is the most wide-ranging um, adjudication um, scheme out there, and that's because you can refer any dispute at any time. It's not limited to payment disputes. Um, once the adjudicator has been um, issued the referral, they have 28 days to make a decision. Those 28 days can be extended unilaterally for by 14 days uh, by the referring party, which means that it could go up to 42 days uh, and then also the parties if they both agree they can extend the adjudicator's decision period even longer um, I've seen a wide range of um, disputes determined within 28 days uh, so it is qu quite possible and it's quite speedy um, 
if we then say move to somewhere else, so for example, if we take South Africa, South Africa doesn't have a statutory adjudication process. Um, it does, though, have contractual adjudication. So they use the FIDIC forms of contract and dispute boards in South Africa. They also have their own forms of contract, such as the JBCC uh, and a wide range of others. Um, they use the NEC as well there. Um, they don't have um, statutory adjudication, but, but adjudication there um, follows the contractual process as stated. One thing that they do have is extremely supportive courts, uh, and the courts in South Africa uh, were strongly influenced because of the common law, uh, 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 common law uh, precedent. That means they took the decisions from the United Kingdom courts, and they have quite quick to enforce. Um, and they are normally enforced no matter what, even if there's a breach of natural justice, the courts in South Africa will tend to enforce. And they enforce on the basis that's what the party signed up to. And even though it's only interim and uh, binding that they will give an enforcement. Um, in Hong Kong at the moment, and, th and this is going to be key to understanding if adjudication is going to work successfully or not, is obviously you've got the um, statutory of payment um, provisions mandated by the government now. Um, I haven't had much feedback from that yet, but I certainly think there's going to be a lot of um, a, a, a lot of lessons learned in this initial process. Um, in the United Kingdom, we've had um, statutory adjudication now for over 20 years. Um, King's College uh, have just recently produced a report on on adjudication. Uh, if any of you can go on the King's College website and look for their adjudication report, I certainly recommend it. It's one of the most detailed reports ever done on adjudication in the United Kingdom, as well as people's perceptions. You can see how the different UK adjudicator nominating bodies are, are working on what they're able to do um, and, and what they're not able to do. Um, you'll also see um, suggestions for changing the uh, Construction Act and scheme. Uh, probably the biggest uh, issue we have in the United Kingdom is that they've got um, uh, exemptions. So, for example, the oil and gas industries are exempt, uh, and there's now uh, a lot of pressure uh, for these exemptions to be removed. Um, Singapore and Malaysia, I believe, have got quite similar schemes in as much as the um, adjudic adjudication deals with payment disputes, and, and, and it's just relatively quick. Um, my understanding is as well that the uh, enforcement in both um, Malaysia and Singapore is extremely quick. Um, if you go across to Australia, Australia is obviously a federal state. Uh, each, each state's got its own sort of way of doing things, and, and for years they haven't been able to align. And I think that one of the issues in Hong Kong um, is obviously dispute boards and, 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 and adjudication were first um, utilised on the Hong Kong airport going back to the early 90s. Um, and since then, um, the reason that adjudication has been hard to implement in Hong Kong is you had a lot of different professional bodies um, who were unable to reach agreement. And this obviously gave uh, gave room to the government to say, well, if you can't agree between yourselves, what can we do? We don't know, you know, who to listen to, which, which what what we should implement, what we shouldn't. Um, so the uh, latest um, government um, initiative in Hong Kong, I think, should be uh, warmly welcomed. Uh, it should be analysed, and it's certainly going to guide. Um, the creation of the, the bill that's going to go before um, the local legislature. Uh, has anyone else got any other questions at this point? Well, uh, due to time constraint, I believe that would be your last questions. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, would you join me in another round of applause for our speakers? <laughs>